Hi everyone, welcome to the Real Estate Tax Tips channel. My name is Cherry Chen, a chartered professional accountant located in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. And I'm on a mission to become the Google map for hardworking Canadians seeking financial freedom. And normally when I say my tagline, I uh, have this huge smile. But today is a different day. Today is the day after the federal budget uh, being announced in 2024, the day after, and I'm still trying to absorb the whole income tax rate change on capital gain inclusion. And I am so angry. I just got up at 4.30 this morning thinking about the whole thing. I got so stressed out about the whole situation. Uh, but I'm going to use this video in particular to explain to you how this would affect you personally. And if you own the properties in the corporation, I'll also go through an example of how this would apply. It sucks. And uh, it's made me angry. If you find this video useful, please make sure that you share with uh, your fellow investor, uh, fellow entrepreneurs as well. Um, and make sure that you spread the word, hit the subscribe button below, and I'll make sure that I keep everybody updated in the next few weeks. Now with that, let's get started. So what the hell happened? yesterday. Well, what happened yesterday was that the federal government announced their 2024 budget. And in this particular budget, they've changed our capital gain inclusion rate. What's that mean? Well, for someone who's earned, who's investing for themselves and who's investing in whether it is in shares, whether it is in uh, private company shares, it could be in um, Rolex watch, it could be in um, rental properties, any type of these transactions, any type of these investment, long-term investments, typically when you sell these properties, only 50% of the profit would be taxable. The other 50% is not taxable. For someone who bought an investment properties years and years ago, like my mom, um, if she decides to sell it after June 25th, she owns that property personally. For the first $250,000, that capital gain inclusion rate stays the same. So $250,000 for the first $250,000, $125,000 is being added to her income. But anything above and beyond that $250,000, any gain that she's made or accrue on that particular property, two thirds of that is going to be included as her income instead of 50%. What a ripoff. I know, I agree. Now, what's worse is that it's penalizing people whose own properties for a long, long period of time and it has an accrued gain and who has been contributing to the residential market, providing housing. They're penalizing these people. Of course, what's worse is that for people who choose to protect their assets and own these rental properties in the corporation's name uh, for legal protection, liability protection purpose, for whatever reason they choose to earn these income in the corporation, if they sell it, uh, after June 24th, the property is owned by the corporation immediately is two third inclusion rate instead of the fifth prior uh, version of it, which was 50%. So the government is penalizing people who own properties inside the corporation for legal protection uh, purpose. Can you imagine owning like uh, four plaques or uh, an A plaques directly in your personal name? Because the government wanted to penalize you on owning properties in the corporation. This is, this sounds so ridiculous. Now, what does that really mean? So I want to show you on screen what it really means. Now, this is an example of someone who makes $250,000 on selling a property. Now, under the existing rule, if that person is um, making $250,000 capital gain from selling a property, under the current scenario, 50% of this $250,000 is taxable. So $125,000 is taxable. Now, out of that $125,000, assuming the, in, the ta income tax rate is at 50%, this person would have to pay $62,500 tax. Now, under the new rule, if this same person, if the person, the taxpayer is earning or owning the property in, the, in, his, in his personal name, there is no change because the capital gain incurred is less than $250,000. So for this particular person, he would still be paying $62,500 tax. However, if the same person owned this particular property in a corporation and earning $250,000, immediately the inclusion rate for the uh, capital gain calculation is 67%, two thirds essentially. And so immediately the taxable amount of income will be increased to 166,000 instead of the $125,000. So the taxable income you can see has increased 
because they chose to protect their assets in the corporation. And now they would need to pay $83,000 tax instead of $62,000. So we're talking about an increase of $21,000 roughly. Now, if this person has sold a property that they have owned for a long period of time and resulted in a $600,000 gain, the same calculation apply. If that $600,000 capital gain is being like in, under the current rule, you will need to pay $150,000 of tax. Now, that same $600,000 capital gain for my mom, if my mom were to sell, my mom probably has even more accrued gain because she bought the property long, long time ago. That amount, that capital gain, $600,000, is now being taxed differently. It would be now taxed, the first $250,000 would be um, included in income. 50% of that would be included in income. And the next $350,000, 67% would be included in income, resulting in a taxable income of $358,000 instead of $300,000. And as a result, the tax payable by my mom would be $179,000 instead of $150,000. Just pure change of tax rule, an increase of $29,000. Sucks. Now, Let's say if my mom owned this particular property in a corporation instead of owning that in personal name. So let's look here, $600,000, the entire amount, the inclusion rate would be 67%. So meaning that the taxable income is roughly around $400,000 and the tax rate approximately is $200,000. So the tax liability is $200,000. So it's essentially an increase of $50,000 um, on income tax liability. And it is also causing a tax integration problem. Uh, our Income Tax Act was originally designed to prevent us from choosing our ownership structure uh, between personal or corporation based on the tax rate. Now there is a delta differences between owning the properties in the personal name versus owning the property in the corporation. If my mom were to own that property in the corporation, she would have to pay $200,000 tax versus owning that in the personal name, she would only pay $179,000. And versus if the rule didn't get changed, both under personal or corporation, it would only result in $150,000 of tax. As you can see, this has gone crazy and the tax integration does not work under this proposed legislation. What's the worst part about this change in legislation is that it's effective on June 25th onwards. So essentially for transactions that are being uh, closed on June 25th onwards. Now, is this going to come into law? We don't know at this moment, unfortunately. There are, there's no way to know, but it's most likely that the NDP is going to side with the liberals. And even though the conservative is likely, they already said that they are going to uh, go vote against it, but it's likely still going to be passed because the NDP is going to vote for it. On to the ne next tax change that I want to talk about is the lifetime capital gain exemption. So they pissed enough people off. I'm not really sure if I'm allowed to say pissed, but I'm just going to say it. They've pissed enough people off about selling uh, earning capital gain. So a bunch of people who earn capital gain are small business owners like you and I. Um, and we're small business owner, as in we own um, a small business, we run small businesses. What they say is that if you sell shares of this business, the government is increasing that lifetime capital gain exemption to $2 million for qualified businesses and individuals. Now, who are those qualified businesses and individuals? Those qualified uh, businesses and individuals are not long-term buy and hold corporations owner, unfortunately. They are uh, businesses that exclude, do not include professional services, consulting businesses, and um, a business that result in like one person doing all the marketing. So yes, they are excluding me as an accountant. They're excluding the sale of a dental practice. They're excluding the sale of the lawyer on this increase in, on this bump up of lifetime capital gain exemption rule as well. So they are single handedly pointing out and targeting these service provider, thinking that they don't actually need to work hard for their money. And they're not even providing this exemption, extending this exemption to these particular businesses. They are calling them out and they exclude th this group of people. And it's ridiculous. And I can't tell you how upsetting it is. Now, the next thing is about home buyer plan. So they've made some changes also to the home buyer's plan. Um, 
they claim that to help the first time home buyers, um, the budget is proposing to increase from $35,000 to $60,000, essentially allowing uh, first time home buyers, qualified first time home buyers. And you need to check the definition of who are the qualified first time home buyers. They do not only, they do not include just first time home buyers. They include like first time home buyers who are maybe coming out from a divorce or common law situation. There are a bunch of rules that you may fall into that category and you may be able to take advantage of this new and extended first time home buyers plan. If you're one of those qualified first time home buyers individual and planning to buy a properties uh, in the future, uh, you're in luck because instead of allowing you to borrow against your RSP up to $35,000 to help you to purchase your first time uh, first home, you are now eligible to borrow against uh, your RSP up to $60,000. So from $35,000 to $60,000 for eligible home buyer. And they um, typically the uh, repayment to the RSP would be starting three years after your withdrawal. Now they've delayed at three years to five years. So you don't have to do any repayment to your RSP until uh, five years later. So they've made it a little bit easier for people who are uh, borrowing to uh, purchase their first home. Now, one particular person from my YouTube channel also asked me about this accelerated capital cost allowance um, calculation deductions that's being announced during the budget. I almost overlooked it because I was so upset about the entire capital gain inclusion situation. And I got even more upset about the lifetime capital gain exemption, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so what is this new accelerated capital cost allowance thing? Four. Well, basically, if you're building a purpose-built rental building, uh, starting at least the construction has to begin after April 15, 2024. So essentially a couple of days ago, and the construction has to begin between April 15, 2024 and January 1st, uh, 2031 you are going to get an accelerated um, capital cost allowance deduction against the rental income. Now, so what does that mean? So for these type of eligible properties that are being built after April 15, 2024, you would be able to claim 10% capital cost allowance to offset against the rental income that you're reporting. Now, remember, capital cost allowance is depreciation. And capital cost allowance is kind of like RSP. Um, you contribute to RSP so you don't pay tax on the amount of contribution that you make. For CCA, for capital cost allowance, you take the deduction. You don't pay tax on the amounts that, um, that you've claimed as capital cost allowance. Just like RSP, when you take the money out from your RSP, you have to report it back to income. So capital cost allowance is the same way. So when you sell the property um, that you've claimed 10% capital cost allowance on, you're required to add all these capital cost allowance that you've claimed over the years, years after years after years, to income as recapture income. And that would have to be added to your income the year that you sell the property. So for some investors, it doesn't even make sense for them to um, take this 10% uh, accelerated capital cost allowance. It's almost It almost feels like, hey, you are um you are increasing the increasing the inclusion rate and raising tax on everybody who's buying uh, who's trying to do provide rental housing and you turn around and then give you some uh, give you some small amount of deduction and it's not even a deduction it's a deferral because you eventually would have to pay tax when you sell the property so it's not even really that much fun now to qualify for this particular accelerated capital cost allowance um deduction or deferral, um, basically the unit, the purpose-built rental housing unit has to be at least four apartment building, purpose-built building, and 90% of the residential units are held for long-term rental. And it seems like it is in alignment with the HST, uh, the HST rebate on new purpose-built rental housing as well. So they're giving an accelerated uh, capital cost allowance deduction or deferral. I like to call it deferral um, for people who start building April 15, 2024 onwards. So yes, so that sum up the only thing that only positive thing, which I don't even know if it is positive uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, from our current federal budget. Now that I've covered everything, if you ask me, this is a really shitty budget.
if you don't agree with me, by all means, leave the comment, leave your comment and thoughts in the uh, comment section below. I'm happy to discuss with you. Um, until next time, I can't even say, usually I end this with, until next time, happy Canadian real estate investing. I can't even bring myself to say that because this has been so overwhelming. Well, until next time. <laughs>